the first thing to say about soft power is that really it is the opposite of propaganda. Soft power is something that's created by people, not by governments. We tell the story of the Foundling Hospital, which was simultaneously the UK's first children's charity and also the UK's first public art gallery. Autograph um, is coming up to 30 years old and it's interesting we talk about the past and the present. Specifically those three things are race, rights and representation. I decided to go into commercial media and I went into television in the 90s and I thought well this is a big bang you know we have this new media verse exploding <coughs> and, it, and it's by no means finished. Lots of strands <laughs> in the three different presentations, the issue of public space, uh, the issue with the artist, uh, it comes through uh, the, I think all three presentations, the issue around um, empathy, I think is an interesting one actually. And I'd like to pick up on the empathy issue because on one hand uh, we can deny it exists, on the other hand maybe it's a powerful force and it's part of soft power. So I wonder, at the moment we're in a refugee crisis mode, you referred to Windrush, yes. in, which I think is a, a, a live crisis here. Um, how do you see the refugee crisis in its point of relevance to museums, your museum, or any museum, and I'm going to kind of ask you two and you, you three. Um, well, I think um, it goes back, Ali, what you were saying, with this idea of things being complex. Um, I was talking to Mark beforehand about a show we're going to be doing in the spring about children living in poverty in London, and it's complex. It, it is multiple reasons why somebody, why a family, will find themselves in that situation, and it's the same thing. And I think. Uh, at their best, and I, I completely endorse Mark what you were saying, but I think at their best, um, museums can be a space for uh, slow thinking and complex thinking of different ideas coming, of holding multiple ideas at the same time, often contradictory ideas, of a pace slowing down to allow people to think over periods of time to reflect that it isn't a fast soundbite. It isn't necessarily also something that proposes an answer, which I think is, and, and I would say that a lot of what we try to do is to, in different ways, sometimes very explicitly, tooling up our visitors and going, here is a call to action, go and do that. <laughs> and other times just, uh, we were talking again about unpacking the meaning behind often very simple phrases, very simple pieces of ideology, very simple narratives that we kind of absorb as propaganda from hard power sources and the media and that, that what some of these things mean so that people are more alert to them and are less, are more questioning, um, which I suppose is the, the kind of the, the first stage to you know, a riot in a public place is that people have to actually begin to see that they are that they are not being told the truth, or that the situation is more complicated, or that they actually have an agency in a situation that they better now they now better understand and and see. I, so I, it's a it's a complicated way, but I think it's that <coughs> thing about being able to hold multiple ideas together, think about things over a, over a longer period of time, but. You know, Mark, your point is absolutely true, is, is that you, in order to have those multiple thoughts and multiple perspectives, you need multiple voices in there mm -hmm. to, be, to be proposing <coughs> things and to making things more complicated and more complex. Um, yeah. Multiple voices. Or, multiple, to pick up on or, that? Or, 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 or different temporalities, different mm -hmm. times. Yeah. Is, 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 I keep on thinking about um, how we it's amazing we're all in this room at the same time but we're all forged in different kind of like moments if you like and i think that that's a for me the, the complexities of that is that how do we see each other in the same time and by that i mean i i could argue that you know i i live in what could be called racial time you might live in gender time you might live in a kind of middle class time and they're all different temporalities of being and if we don't recognize those different ways of being then the conversation is simply going to be dried up. That's a much more um, nuanced way of thinking about how we are in, say, a museum. Mm -hmm. So when I'm standing in front of a piece of work or an artist's thing, I'm in a different time than your time, mm -hmm. but we're sharing something about the way that you might want me to act. And I think that you know, people, the migrant, the refugee, 
the asylum seeker, they're all very different, by the way. They're not some homogenous group of just other people. They all come from very different and particular trajectories into our time. The question is, how do they impact on our time? And what are we going to do with that, kind of collectively, as we come at this from all of our different perspectives, whether it's one of intolerance or whether it's one of generosity. And I think we've, we've in, in an incredibly, I think we've entered a new phase of hostility, if you like, around what we, I think all the lessons from World War II, Malta, and all the, all, all the lessons of, of, uh, of, of the Holocaust and the violence have been forgotten. I think the cultural amnesia needs to, be, needs to be discussed. And I think the museum is a place where we can be reminded of those spaces. But I also think, you know, museums are also very problematic places because it's about, you know, who gets to narrate the, who gets to narrate the story is also very, very, very problematic. And I also think, just very quickly, you know, I, I can't, I, I'm thinking about the kind of cultural work the new museum of African-American history and culture is doing in, in Washington, right? Apparently, you can't get in for the waves of people that want to see it. So it's doing great, great work, right? Soft power, you might argue, at its most prevalent. But it's taken, you know, 400 years for a museum to arrive. So you have to look at that museum in the context of that journey. I could argue in terms of the museums on the Mall, it's like a migrant museum arriving. It's the last museum, it's the last one on the block to arrive and yet thousands of tens of thousands of people want to see it. So the metaphor I'm making, the metaphor there is that we are all in different times. Sometimes are much more pressing than others. And unless we remember in a kind of, um, I, I suppose in a, in a, in a classic post-World War II Levinas way, that if I can't see you and you can't see me, then we are fundamentally doomed. And if the museum is a place where you can see me and I can see you, then we can have a discussion about the trajectories of our temporalities. And if they're not available, then I suggest that riot is a result. Actually, I have something to comment on that. There's a, this is a technology movement, but it is called embodied narrative and it, it uses virtual reality um, to put you in another body and uh, I'll, I'll just describe my experience with it. Um, there's a, a group there in France and they have a, a project called the machine to be another which is a VR experience but instead of sort of titillating you and stuff. Did, did you happen to hear about this? No. It was at the Young Vic but now uh, the, the guy who does it, his name is Philippe, he's at uh, the Center for Interdisciplinary Research, oh, the CRI in I, Paris. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and this was remarkable because what it, it would take several minutes and it was quite involved, but they would put you, uh, you know, the headset on and all of that and the headphones so you're isolated from the world. But the, the one that I experienced was being uh, an elderly gentleman in a favela whose son has just died and he's they're remembering, uh, or rather his son died a year ago and his wife is coming and telling me about all the memories and they actually have somebody touching you, so when the wife comes and touches your hand, when I mean, you put out your hand and you're, you're told to, to, to copy this, and you, you don't see your hand, you see the hand of some, a Brazilian in a favela in, in Rio, and, and she, she touches it, and, and you feel this. And actually, this, this was remarkable, and I think this is actually one of the things that make me feel optimistic, is that these technologies can put you in another body. Mm -hmm. and people who went into that regularly felt like, and this is a psychological fact, that if you actually see your hands a certain way and, and they, they hold a mirror up to your face and whatnot, so they hold this mirror up and you, you, become. you become that person. And uh, it, it's remarkable. I, I feel like I, it feels like I had this other short life that I just sort of remember outside of my own life. So there, there are some promising things and the museum is the ideal context uh, for the, or, or theater um, for, the, for something like the machine to be another. Uh, I guess I, I think that's a great example. Um, I, I think your example of the National African American Museum of Heritage Culture in, in Washington, we, we worked on the master plan I for know. that. And I think it also proves the point that you made, which is it took an African American, Lonnie Bunch III, to be able to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And there were enormous debates about what is the story anyway? Is it a story of victimhood? Is it a story of rebellion and revolution? Is it, what is the, the arch, the overarching narrative? And after a year or two, Lonnie came up with quite simply a genius idea. And I, I guess I'd say I don't think you need any technology to get it. I think you just need that temporal perspective, as you say, which is, well, um, 
this is the story of America told through the black experience. Mm. And I think, again, I, I, I just uh, I have to say that one of the impetuses for the book, because the book was written before Brexit and before Trump, so we have to do another one now because it, you know, obviously reality has changed quite a bit. But why don't museums just do that? I mean, why wouldn't you invite people with other perspectives in? Why wouldn't you invite people from other countries to talk about how they see the Syrian collection or, or the Maltese material? I mean, I, I guess I, 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 I think the reality with museums is that the remnants of hard power, because our museums were all forged out of hard power. That's mm -hmm. where the collections come from. I mean, I have two Canadian friends here, and I mean, most of our collections of any value came from what the RCMP confiscated from uh, Indigenous people. It all comes out of hard power, and it just ends up that it's very hard to overthrow that inheritance. So I, 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 I don't know how you feel. The, there's this academic yeah. thing that feeds into museums. So if you're going to invite these people, then they have to be credible, which means they have to no, be have think. credentials. Well, this no, is this is the thinking to. that I've seen. Is, is it really, that yeah. it's having mm. the right credentials, and that's a whole other barrier to self to expression and having a, a, well, a place in the then. room or at the table. Well, they well, will they, die. They, they are, me. actually. So but. I wonder if we should turn it out to, I sort of see a lot of sparks in the audience and maybe some, some of you would like to pose some questions or make some brief statements. Yes. Um, thank you. This has been an absolutely fascinating um, discussion. Do you need me to use the mic? Are you okay? Uh, I'll try to speak up, up with yeah. my American voice. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I have my background at Google, YouTube, and, and Facebook, um, so I, I love the piece on technology. But what I really wanted to press on is um, the role in today's world of bringing out through digital technology that voice of the amateur, um, but then combined with when you're really thinking about the pull factor of soft power, so often in organizations I've seen it takes the celebrity uh, to get the people to come. And I always found that really frustrating, heading up the politics and government division at Facebook, because I always thought some of the most transformative voices in their countries were the people that didn't have the name ID to bring the people in the room to hear from them. And so when we think about uh, you know, soft power, what do you see through your perspectives? And our uh, chair can decide how you want to, to handle this. I'm sure you all have thoughts. But you know, what is that balance? How do we get beyond? that natural attraction to the celebrity um, in a world where we're seeing such a shift in power uh, to you know, the, the voices of the, of the unknown. Well, actually, that's a good segue for you, because it was a pile of celebrities who changed the view in this country of, of, uh, of uh, orphans. So you might want to, I don't think celebrity is anything new. I think it's quite. An well, exactly. Handle uh, and all of these names can yeah. yes. right. what yes. our interests. Yes, you know? it's true. How do we get beyond that? Well, it's funny, isn't it? I was thinking about what you were saying about technology. Um, and I'm very conflicted uh, about technology, but. Uh, so uh, there are two things going, which is not going to make a particularly coherent answer. Because on the one hand, I find it uh, problematic that somehow people have to be given headsets and this and the other to put themselves into somebody else's, to, to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. You have to go, really? Your imagination is that limited that you cannot, without being sort of, in a sense, somehow digitally erased and put into somebody else, you can't protect yourself forward. On the other hand, that technology has a, has a sort of celebrity-like power in as much as I went to see the Modigliani show at Tate uh, Modern and I was very lucky enough to be invited to an early morning viewing and we were in the I think we were about two rooms from the end and we had a fantastic guide who was taking us around who said oh you might want to sort of either quickly either skip the last rooms or kind of do them very fast because at 10 o'clock the doors will open and there's going to be a stampede because I don't know if you, any of you saw the show but they had a kind of virtual reality where you could put a headset on and personally I I didn't get the point. You got to go. There were lots of photographs of his studio where he lived, and you could put on a virtual headset and go, "Look." You go, "Yeah, I know. I could work that out for myself. I could see the photographs." But nevertheless, apparently, people were queuing for hours to put a headset on to have this experience, and to the extent that don't worry about actually looking at the art. <laughs> Just <laughs> quite almost a queue up thing. And I think that the celebrity of the technology, this show that we're doing next year about childhood poverty. My plan is to harness that in the knowledge that somebody will wait for an hour in a queue 
to put on a headset to then be shown something that actually they've just seen while they're stuck in the queue I'm going to deconstruct how <laughs> uh, for them graphically how a child ends up in poverty because they are trapped because the celebrity of the thing will keep them there and when they actually then put the headset on you go you know what there is nothing to see because if you're living in poverty you have nothing but thanks for your time but it's an interesting thing isn't it it's like yeah. that's the thing it's like kind of so I think there is a power there because that sort of that cutting edge stuff has a has an attraction that people will queue for hours travel distances to experience that thing. So it's how we use that. See, I think it goes down to, boils down to human psychology though. I, I, I think, uh, and I'm not one to defend technology, but the, the fact is, is some people are quite good at empathy and others aren't good at empathy. So any tool that can help them become empathetic yeah. is great. Um, maybe you, you're, you're quite capable of doing that. Well, um, the, 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 the thing you just spoke about the favela though, that kind of makes you an isolated unit of of empathy in the same way that you're an isolated unit of consumption if you buy something from Amazon and have it delivered to your home. Right. It's still an act of isolation and it's still an act of control because it actually limits your experience of your reality. You're entering into a controlled kind of environment where there are limitations to that. Yeah, well, well they certainly are, but, but well, it's, 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 no, it's, it's, it's a synth that, well, it's in the same as, I, actually, I prefer yeah. reading because oh, um, say, reading is quite, stimulates my imagination yeah. quite a bit more, but a, a well-designed film or book or painting, it all fixes you in a thing, and it, I mean, you can't blame them for the things that they can't do. I think it's, if it's right. focused on giving you a certain perspective that then you take into the rest of your life, it then it's useful. It's politicization, though. Even the whole thing of soft power, to some degree, is yeah. to the politicization of museum culture. In a way, it's rather than looking at artifacts from the past, it's saying, we have, be it a left-wing agenda, whatever the agenda is, this is, it, it's called soft power, but it's actually just a political agenda. And it's using a, quite a kind of bourgeois kind of model of, um, to your point, it's sort of drawing things into a into a world that exists in quite a kind of cloistered Oxford, Cambridge. I'm an academic. Hmm. You know, it's it's just preaching to converted. Well, 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 just, I don't is, think it's reaching out right. to those kids. Really, this is super you know? dialogue, but I want more people to have a chance. So that, mm. thanks. I think you made a lot of really powerful points. So thank you. Yeah. Yes, this lady, and then you. Yeah. like to ask a question to Carol Howells and Mark Seeley um, about the impact of our um, collections in museums and our archives on changing history, the history mm. that um, ordinary people and children, I mean, lots of children come to these museums, etc. And for the Foundling Museum, Probably the most famous exhibition in the last 10 years was the Threads of Feeling exhibition. Perhaps you could say something about that because it brought together empathy, emotion, and the individual. It made that central to how people saw poverty. Um, and the other thing for Mark Seeley, the impact of the slavery compensation project um, which comes out of work in the National Archives, but a great deal more could be done with the, um, the implications of this for how we write our histories of industrialization, the Industrial Revolution, etc. It is not a story of the great success of the hard men of the North, but of all that taxpayers Money paid right. to Caribbean right. planters to compensate we'll them. That one, yeah. Yeah. Compensate That's right. them for right. um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for their plantations, and there is so much more that right. that might be made of that. But it right. is changing what um, our histories are. So just to mix it up, I'll start with Mark, yeah. and then we'll move to yeah. yes. Well, <laughs> any good crime novel just says follow the money. Yeah. <laughs> Just follow the money. You'll soon find out what actually happened, where and when, and where the players, whether it's the Church of England or great enlightened thinkers. If you follow the money, you follow the thing. You follow the thing right down until its bottom line. I mean, most people don't even think about, you know, let's just say the Church of England owning 
been a slave owning kind of culture. It doesn't happen at the pulpit every Sunday. No one even understands that. No, no one understands that space. No one really understands that abolition was paid for by the right. British taxpayer. <laughs> it's not some great benevolent act of freedom. Yeah. No one understands that freedom. It was all paid for. Absolutely everything. There would have been there would have been riots in the Caribbean if billions of pounds hadn't have been given to those plantation owners. They would have fought, they would have resisted it, fought it. I mean, plus the fact abolition and slavery. I mean, we all know it never ended. It simply evolved. I mean, it's just you can't big draw a line around William Wilberforce in 1807 or 1839. Things just evolve. Acts in Parliament don't change that much on the ground. I mean, most people that were living in conditions of slavery, once these acts had passed and whatever, were simply left into another economic trap. So the whole idea that we've been this wonderful nation of, you know, freedom giving, and also the whole idea of enlightenment thought was incredibly racialized anyway. Who was free to think? Who was included as a human subject? Which brings you all the way back to you know, a Gambon and Homo Sacer, who's in the civic society, which is incredibly relevant to today. Who's in the conversation? Who's allowed into civic power? And who's excluded in that? <coughs> Whose life is worth anything, right? All these dead bodies, what you've got is a whole generation of artists. Now, I've been working in the arts for like 30, 40 years, and it's really interesting. The amount of black artists that are desperately mining this space of knowledge formation around slavery. Now, I've been in, it, in the conversation for a while. I'm like, when do we free ourselves from this space? Because it's a trap. Right? We're completely left in that space. Because the only place for visibility sometimes in those museums is to have that conversation. What I really like, I love the idea of having an imagination, right? I don't want to live in your disaster. I don't want to have to name that space all the time. I think it's really important that those narratives get rewritten. I think people need to be really encouraged to understand that it's not even that complex. It's not a great theoretical space. It's like theft, robbery, and reparation. That's all it is. Once you understand that trilogy, then things can move on. Now, the question is, the museum <laughs> and how it articulates that, that's also an, an ongoing, unfolding story which should be part of the everyday, if you like. So it shouldn't be something that's revealed to us through things, ridiculous things, like Black History Month. Because how can you have black history in a month? How can you racialize history, right? How can you talk about how can you talk about over there without talking about here, right? We are in that space. We are in that history. It's intricately interlocked with each other. There is no other. There's just, do you know what the most radical space is? <laughs> it's between the sheets, right? All that stuff that happens in that space is what needs to be discussed. Desire, love, all those imaginative possibilities of when people interlock with each other. And all that stuff gets unfolded in a totally different way. Okay? And I think one of the questions was to you as well. well and that's really interesting because next. I've been trying for a number of years now to... Um, Thanks, Mark. To, it, it, really, it's a PhD. We need to fund a PhD. There's 900 linear feet of archive. The Family Hospital kept everything, and it's catalogued, but it's not researched, most of it. And I would like to map the triangular trade onto the triangle of the hospital, because you have the perfect triangle. You have the money coming in, so the benefactors. The single biggest benefactor of the Family Hospital was a man called Thomas Emerson, who left his entire fortune, and he was a sugar refiner. Right, there you go. So Handel had shares in um, sugar plantations. It's impossible to have great wealth in the 18th century and not be involved in the triangular trade. Yeah, yeah. You have the children coming in. Um, their, their admission documentation um, doesn't record their ethnicity. So even though uh, there is space for them to do it, we by accident bump into subsequent references in their apprenticeship indentures or something that they are Negro, mulatto, black. Um, but they are coming in. We have a token that a mother left in the 18th century, which is carved onto Mother of Pearl, which says, James, son of James Culcannon, late or now of Jamaica. There you go. So who is, who is James Culcannon? What is he doing in Jamaica? Where is he coming from? Mary Lammas, who we discovered by accident looking for something else, who was a little black girl, who was that once they went through their education through the hospital there, they would then have a supervised apprenticeship, which lasts six, six or seven years, and only after li completing their apprenticeship successfully, they left the care of the hospital. Mary, this um, black 
Newfoundland girl, uh, was apprenticed to be a ship's cook. On what ship? Going where? Doing mm. what? So all of these foundling children are mm. going into the trades, which are all linked to this thing. So we have this perfect triangle that speaks wow. to, the, mm. from, the, from top to bottom and from bottom up, how this trade worked mm. and how it affected all of society. This is a huge piece of research because it is, it's there, but mm. it is not there. You, it, so it, like I said, it's a PhD. We are trying to find somebody to fund this PhD. Going back to your point about the tokens, which are the little fabric pieces that were cut from baby's clothes that acted as a form of identifier if a mother ever came back to claim her child because it was given a new name. It was a very, uh, very successful show. Interestingly, the more Beautiful. successful show yeah came in 2015, where we uh, looked at 2015, 2016, 2015, 2015. Um, and it was called The Fallen Woman. And we, that in the 19th century, they changed the admission procedures, whereas before it was a lottery. In the 19th century, the child had to be illegitimate. It had to be the mother's first child, and she had to prove to the governor's satisfaction that she was a pre of previous good moral character i.e. as a result of sex outside marriage, she had lost her respectability. She was a fallen woman. And this reflected the Marriage Act, the changes to the poor laws, changing Victorian social and moral values. So our exhibition, The Fallen Woman, women in the 19th century had to complete petitions, whereas previously it was anonymous. They had to go into incredible detail, not just their name, their age, where they lived, the name of the father, what his job was, where he was, a narrative about how they met, how, they, how their relationship developed, when they first had sex, how often they had sex, what she did when she found out she was pregnant. They would then come in for interview, they would be interviewed by an all-male panel of governors, they would have to relive rape experiences, they would have to, then the hospital's inquirer would follow up on their story, talk to their landlords, talk to their vicars, talk to their employers. Was she in fact a good girl? and through, you know, fault or misadventure, and then they made a decision. Now, the exhibition took uh, 18 months of research, going through these hundreds of petitions. They kept all the petitions, the successful ones and the unsuccessful ones. This is the closest we will get to the voices of working class women talking about their own experience. It was an extraordinary show, but what was more extraordinary was before Parliament recessed, just before the summer, they passed the new welfare bill, which, if you know your your universal credit, there's another misnomer. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you now have child tax credit is restricted to the first two children. And when it was raised in Parliament that what would happen to a woman who gave birth to a third child as a result of rape, Eric Pickles, the minister for, um, was it society and goodness knows what, said that uh, robust systems would be put in place for determining which children had been born as a result of rape. You were like, wow, yeah. really? And we thought we were putting on this historic show about what was happening a hundred years ago, about judgment passed on women and how the thing... And it just... So this thing about the role of history, so it is both the bringing to the fore voices of people who are not heard, mm. but in that thing about the agents for change, the comment book, it was... There was outrage in the comment book from people who made that explicit connection mm. between wow. what women then were being made to go through and, and how they were having to prove their worthiness, this and the other, and what was happening now and what was happening to the changes to the benefit system, the, the bedroom tax, and it's that kind of thing. So you're absolutely right. It's about in those archives mm. are the voices of the people that do not get heard, but also are the voices that we, that lots of communities recognize because the experience that these people are going through are experiences that continue to go about, prove yourself, justify yourself, convince us that you are worthy. Oh, that's amazing. And I think one last question, if you still have it. Yeah, I do. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, it's a fascinating panel. Thank you. I have a question for Mark. Um, I kind of, uh, I, I very much agree that riots are a fantastic tool for society to challenge the status quo, to challenge the structure of power. Um, and I go by William Blake's quote, which is, I must create a new system or we'll be enslaved by another man. If soft power is an attempt to create a new system, where do you think it's going wrong and what does it need to improve? That's a good question. <clears throat> I think the problem that I have, I think, as I said earlier, the, I, I'm not really subscribing to the idea of what soft power is. I think it's, it's, I think change is very simple, you know. It's back to this kind of the, the economy of things. I, I mean, I make myself very unpopular at the Arts Council saying, well, if you want a more diverse portfolio, we've just signed new four-year funding agreements, 
and one of the arts executives stands up and says, well, you know, we're not doing very well on the diversity side of things. We haven't made that much progress, but, you know, most of you in the portfolio round will probably still be in it, and there isn't that much room for new people to be in there. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, if you've got the purse strings, why are you funding failure in that space? Mm -hmm. Why are you going to reward the same people in the same spaces who are not capable, it seems to me, of changing their organisations? And I'm not talking about pop-up programmes where, you know, you do something for a you know, school group in Brixton or a school group in Bristol, you know, where, you know, disenfranchised kids or working class kids, whatever. I'm talking about structural change. If you want to have a more diverse workspace, then you simply have to say, you're not being funded to do that at government level. So what does that say to me? Is that the government's very happy with what it's got? It's not really committed to any form of social change. It's kind of paying lip service to kind of equality and gender, and, you know, pay gaps and all those things which, when you read through the reporting side of things, which we have to account for as we take this funding, it's not really going anywhere. So if, if cultural institutions are part of a soft power agenda, and if soft power has taken responsibility for bringing different voices into the conversation, then today it's failed. And what can it do to improve that? Well, riot. <laughs> well, look, I do, I'm talking about riot as a kind of metaphor as well. I think, you know, if you stand up in the room and say enough's enough, that for me is an act of riot, right? I'm not talking about necessarily, you know, I like, <laughs> you know, I, I don't have any problem with people having to, maybe it's because of where I'm forged and, where, and what, I've, what I've had to do. I don't have a problem with fighting at all. No problem at all with it. I think it's absolutely essential. I think if I look at Palestine, if I look at places on the globe which have had to fight, there are dark forces at play. They're not all going to respond to a cosy glass of wine and a private view. It ain't going to happen. And we're so far apart from those that are close to riot that when it happens, it's often a shock. It's like, where did that come from? Right? Shit. So I say, beware. <laughs> So, so, so maybe you'd like to sum up your thoughts, and you'll sum up yours briefly, and then we'll turn it over to you to. Then we go conclude. outside, have a glass of uh, wine, and then and keep we'll on can see and keep on. <laughs> yeah. So I just think, of, like each panelist, just to maybe sum up. We well, I'd say we're at a point um, where actually our common humanity may become really apparent against some of the forces that are arrayed against us. So it, it behooves us now to, to break down these barriers mm -hmm. and um, actually create capillary channels and actually listen to other voices. I mean, I agree with Mark that you know power is never given, it's taken. Mm -hmm. But we also can help redistribute it with every act of attention that we give, whether it's what show you go to, where you patronize, where you make a decision. Um, and I, I think from what I've seen in mass media, actually it really comes down not to these big hegemonic, hegemonic institutions. It comes down to individual choices that aggregate into social tendencies. Which is exactly the story, as I said, that we are trying to tell, is, is that there is no, you know, if, if human beings have got us into this mess, then human beings will get us out of this mess but it's not other people. It has to be us. It has to be a sense of a personal responsibility and, and a sense of the potential there. Um, and I think in a, in a small way, it's what we try to do, but we could always be doing it better and we should probably be doing it differently as well. But I think you, you have to travel in hope. <laughs> and I think for us, you know, the portrait of Thomas Gorham, on the bad days, you stand in front of it and go 17 and a half years. It took him 17 and a half years. You know, it's like, just keep going and take responsibility for anything and everything that you can. Well, with that, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to thank each one of our panelists and all of you as an audience for your participation, for your rapt attention. And I think in that, we've uh, built a soft power relationship, actually. Thank you very much.